Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner, a podcast where we fight till we drop, and then we are fully rested by the time we hit the floor. Well, guys, you know, I was going to do this little podcast this time around about an episode of church history uh, that I think is very moving and very impactful. I have to lay some ground. I'm going to read you something. I'm going to read you something very long. And uh, but I have to lay some groundwork because uh, this is uh, this does not happen in a vacuum. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Waldensians, uh, but you should have. They are a group, a community of Christians lived in the Alpine Alp Mountains of uh, France, Italy, a little bit into Spain. And there are some things that mark them as being distinct. Sometimes by some people call them the Leonists. Uh, they have a handful of other names, but they come from the valley area in those mountains. And um, the, the, because their their term apparent the their the word Waldensian is is from uh, the French word Vadu, which is the word for valley. Peter Waldo was a Waldensian, uh, and you anyway. Some of the, one of the things that marked this particular Christian community <clears throat> um, is that they claim that they received the gospel directly from the Apostle Paul. Uh, there's a there's a verse in the back of the book of Romans when Paul is talking about he's going to come see the church at Rome uh, after his trip to Spain. And so the idea and one of the theories is that when Paul went from Spain to Rome, he had to go right through this valley. And they believe and that's what they've taught since 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 as far back. I mean, we're talking 12th, 13th century documentation where they've claimed and they've stuck to their guns on this, that they received that their community received the, the gospel from the Apostle Paul. And so uh, one of, that's one of the things that marks them is their antiquity and, and, and their, their pretty clear uh, origin story. One of the other things that marks them is there's their ceaseless efforts at evangelism. These are the guys that are the street preachers. When Europe has the place, uh, I'm sorry, when the Catholic Church has Europe on lockdown during the Dark Ages, you know, the entrance of thy word giveth light. And when Catholic takes, takes away your Bible, then it becomes the Dark Ages. Um, when the when the Catholic Church has Europe on lockdown, these are the guys that are smuggling handwritten Bibles all over Europe, into Italy and France especially. These are the people that are preaching on the streets. These are the guys that are doing all the witnessing. These are the guys that are doing the work uh, during that period of time, the Waldensians. And so uh, the other thing that marks them is their ceaseless, almost ceaseless persecution at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has a long history. I'm talking centuries of just having getting their fill of these guys and rolling into town with an army and burning a village down and killing the men and raping the women and burning their scriptures. It's been an ongoing thing. And once the Inquisition got good up and running, uh, and once the, uh, the the legislation was in effect, so that the the Catholic Church could lean on local sheriffs and local officials to go scoop up their enemies. Uh, it was very common for the Catholic Church to uh, to scoop up some of these guys, and they would be out and about doing the doing the business of life or doing the business of the ministry. And uh, they would take them and they would torture them. And if you want to find out some interesting history, look into the history of what what happened to Bible believing Christians at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church, not for a week or a month or a day, but for six hundred years. So, all that groundwork being laid, I'm going to read you a letter. Now, here's the context of the letter. Two Waldensian pastors had been picked up by the papists, and they had been tortured for their heresies, put on trial for their heresies, tortured for their heresies. And uh, there are some success stories uh, in the face of that sort of treatment, but this is not one of them. These two men were broken by their torturers. And they recanted of their heresy of believing in Scripture alone. They recanted of their heresy of believing salvation by grace through faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They they recanted of their heresy uh, about the the Pope not being the supreme authority on earth. They recanted of all the things they believed, agreed with the Catholic Church, and so now that they've been effectively neutralized, the papists turn them loose out in the street. And they found, these men found that once they were out of the dungeon, and they were out in the breathing free air and enjoying free sunshine, that they were extremely ashamed that they had been broken and that they had 
betrayed the Lord and they have betrayed the church. And so the, rather than go into hiding, they gathered the local churches together. They put the word out. We'd like to get everybody together. We'd like to talk about what happened. And so an assembly of churches was put together in August of, of 1655. And at that assembly, this letter was read that I'm about to read to you. If you're saved, this is our heritage. If you're saved, these are your kinfolk. And I think one of the problems the American church has is we have a uh, historical amnesia. In, in these letters, back when men were actually doing things, there was no talk of, your best life now or how God's going to help you with your finances. I could say a lot more, but I'm just going to read this and however long it takes to read this, I'm just going to read it and we're going to go from there. Most honored fathers and brethren in the Lord. We could have wished that a less mournful occasion had caused our present appearance in public and that a more favorable opportunity had made us known to the world by some notable action the remembrance of which might have been as a blessing in the churches. But as our names can only be famous by the horrible scandal which we have brought upon the church of God, we now come forth out of the dark dungeons of our own shame and confusion and present ourselves before men to testify to all the world our conversion and repentance and to give indubitable proofs of our grief that we have been so base as to forsake our former profession. When we reflect upon those advantages with which, above others, the Lord was pleased to bless us in granting us our religious education and the knowledge of His saving grace, thus teaching us where true happiness is to be found, and finally to have been called to the highest employment that men can have in this world, viz. to be heralds of God's justice and preachers of His truth, we cannot without horror speak of our offense, and are constrained to confess that our sin is much more odious, and that having known our Master's will, we nevertheless withdrew our shoulders from his service and have acted in opposition to his command. It was in these last calamities which have overrun our country that we have thus made shipwreck. After having lost our liberty and our goods, when the enemies of the truth having resolved upon extirpating our religion in the valleys of Piedmont exercise the most barbarous, cruel ties upon our countrymen, and we, having fallen into their hands after they had showed us how far their inhumanity could reach to give us a proof of the utmost degree that they caused us to be thrown into prison, when they proceeded against us and sentenced us to death as guilty of high treason and the ringleaders of rebellion, incessantly setting before our eyes the torments and punishments to which we are condemned, and to render us more flexible to the enticements of the Jesuits, who without ceasing solicited us to accept of a pardon, which they would obtain for us of our embracing popery and abjuring our religion. At their first onset, we were confident that so far from yielding them, we had strength and fortitude enough to despise whatever superstition could prevent before our eyes as terrible or dreadful, and that the dark and dismal shades of death itself, which which they had threatened him threatened us, were insufficient to extinguish that heavenly light which then shined in our souls. But to our extreme grief. We have learned how frail our nature is, and how deceitful the wisdom of the flesh, which for the enjoyment of a frail and transitory life, prevailed upon us to forego these unspeakably good things which God hath prepared for his children, and the everlasting joy of, those, of which those are made partakers who endure to the end. It was this fleshly wisdom which from a desire to preserve this house of clay, this earthly tabernacle, and to avoid a shameful death, and a punishment anonymous in the eyes of the world that induced us to a shameful falling away, turning our backs upon him who is the fountain of life. We have lent our ears to this deceitful Delilah, and although there were not offered, offered to us any reason so strong as in the least degree to obscure the truth that we did profess, yet we freely acknowledge that the fear of death and the horror of torments shook our courage and beat down our strength, and we have decayed and dried up like water not resisting to blood as the profession not only of Christians, but more especially of Christian ministers obliged us to do. Having been persuaded by deceitful reasoning that life is preferable to death, that we might be further profitable to the church, to our country, and to our families, 
that there was no glory in dying as rebels, and that one day we might get out of captivity and manifest the world, that if the confession had been wanting in our mouths, that the faith had not been wanting in our hearts. Thus we accepted of pardon on these miserable conditions, and have not hesitated to enter into the temple of idols, and employ our mouths and our tongues in uttering blasphemies against the truth of heaven, in denying and abjuring the same, and our sacrilegious hands also in subscribing the acts and events of this infamous apostasy, which has drawn many others into the same perdition. Our light has become darkness, and our salt has lost its savor. We have fallen from heaven to the earth, from the spirit to the flesh, and from life to death. We have made ourselves obnoxious to the curse which the Lord hath pronounced on those by those offenses come. And having made light of the threatenings of the Son of God against those who would deny Him before men, we have deserved to be denied of Him before His Heavenly Father. Finally, we have rendered ourselves unworthy of divine favors and mercy, and have drawn upon our guilty heads whatever is most dreadful in the wrath of God and His indignations, and have deserved to be rejected of the church as stumbling blocks or rocks of offense, and that the faithful should even abhor our company. But as we have learned in the school of the prophets, that the mercies of God are infinite, and the Lord hath no pleasure in the destruction of his poor creatures, but he calleth the sinner to repentance, that he may give him life. We presume to appear before his face, to humble ourselves in his holy presence, to bewail the greatness of our sin, and to make before him a free confession of our iniquity. Oh, that our heads might melt into waters of bitterness, and our eyes were turned into fountains of tears to express the grief wherewith our souls were pressed down. As our sin is of no ordinary measure, so it calls for extraordinary repentance. And as we acknowledge it to be one of the greatest that can be committed, so do we wish that our repentance should reach the lowest degree of humiliation, and that the acts of our contrition may be known to the world. If David, for lighter faults, we're willing that his complaints and his deep sorrow and repentance should be left, as it were, for a memorial in the church. Well, may we not be ashamed to publish among men the unconsolable regret, inconsolable regret, which we feel for having offended God and giving an occasion of scandal to the assemblies of saints, when we deserve to have him printed upon our foreheads a mark of perpetual infamy for our miserable fall, to make the memory thereof continue forever. And if we can make it apparent that the sorrow it hath begotten in us is extreme, and that we now disclaim whatever fear formerly forced us to do contrary to the dictates of our conscience, we trust that he who forgave Peter when he denied Christ in the court of Caiaphas will grant us the same grace. Since we are to come to ask forgiveness in all humility, with tears in our eyes, confession in our mouths, and contrition in our hearts, and that as there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, so there may be joy in the congregation of the faithful when they should behold our conversion to the Lord. Great God, Almighty Father, dreadful in thine anger, in whose presence no sinner can subsist a moment, we prostrate ourselves at the feet of thy majesty as poor, miserable offenders, confessing that we have justly provoked thee to anger by our transgressions and iniquities, and drawn upon ourselves thy righteous judgments, and that we have forsaken thy heavenly truth and bowed the knee before the idol. But how shall we now appear for thee, before thee, O thou judge of the quick and the dead. Since by so doing, we have deserved to feel not only in this life thy most severe rod and punishment, but that thou shouldst also cut us off from the number of the living and cast us headlong into the lake of fire and brimstone where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. O God, rich in compassions and infinite mercies, which thou multipliest even in judgment, turn us and we shall be turned. Be merciful to us, forgive us our offense, blot out our iniquity, impute not our sin unto us. Open unto us the door of thy grace, that we may be partakers of this thy salvation. O Lord Jesus, Redeemer of souls, who came us into this world for the sake of poor sinners, look upon our affliction, receive us to mercy, and grant that our sins being washed away in thy most precious blood, we may draw near to the throne of thy grace with confidence to obtain mercy. Raise us up from our fall, strengthen us in our weakness, and although Satan has sought to sift us, suffer not our faith, faith utterly to fail. Work in us effectually, both to will and to do according to thy good pleasure, 
It is thou who hast stretched out thine hand around us. It is thy strong hand which hath helped us. Thou hast taken us out of captivity, both of body and soul, in which we lay languishing, and hast afforded us the liberty to call upon thy name. Thou hast heard our cries out of the deep, and hast given us fresh cause to rejoice in thy goodness, and to bless thy holy name, to whom be everlasting glory ascribed at all times and in all ages. Amen. And you faithful souls who witness our contrite heart and broken spirit before the Lord, O oh, commiserate our lamentable status. Learn by our example how great is human frailty and what a precipice we fall into whenever God withdraws his supporting hand from us. Consider that as it hath been to us an extreme infelicity to have fallen into such great a sin, so have you an argument to rejoicing God through whose grace you have been given to stand. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Hold fast that which you have, that no man take your crown. Be faithful to the Lord Jesus, even unto death, so that you say, that you so ye may obtain the crown of life. And be assured that aside from the profession of his truth, which you make to the exclusion of all sorts of other religion whatsoever, there is nothing but death, horror, and astonishment. This is a thing which we are enabled to assure you of from our own experience, because from the very first moment that we gave our consent to this unhappy apostasy, our consciences have given us no rest at all, and through their continual harassings and agitations, they have not suffered us to enjoy any of the comfort which a Christian soul experiences in tribulation. Until, it's, until it pleased God to draw us out of the filthy quagmire of Babylon and caused us to return to his ways. And do you Christians lend your helping hand? Let your arms be open to embrace us. Do not count us unworthy of your holy communion, although we have been an occasion of offense. Suffer us to pour into your bosom a torrent of tears, to deplore our condition, and to assure you in the anguish of our souls that our grief is greater than we can express. Help us by your holy prayers to the Lord and publish our repentance in all places where you conceive our sin has been or shall be known that so it may be evident to all the world that from the very bottom of our souls we grieve and are full of sorrow for it. And then the presence of God and of his holy angels as well as of those who now witness our contrition we do abjure and detest the pretended sacrifice of the Mass, the authority of the Pope, and in general, all the worship that is dependent upon them. We recant whatsoever we were pr pronounced to the prejudice of evangelical truth and promise for the future, through divine assistance, to persevere in the profession of the Reformed religion to the last moment of our lives, and rather to suffer death and torments than to renounce that holy doctrine which is taught in our churches, and which we believe to be agreeable to the word of God, all which we protest and promise with our bended knees upon the earth and our hands lifted up to the eternal, our almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as we desire his aid to enable us to do this, even so may he help us, even our God. Amen. Well, brethren, what are you going to do with that? Every time I read that, I've read it more than once, obviously. Every time I read that, I wonder what I would have done. I'm a tough guy. I'm, I'm a tough guy. You just, you just don't even know. But I also know that uh, I'm a man of clay. I'm a man of flesh. And when I look back through church history, and I see men that have endured not only the, the, the harm done to themselves, but the harm done to their families. When I see those men and how they stood, I, I don't know. I don't know if in myself I have that same. Because generally speaking, you don't know what you're going to do until you're there. And I'm sitting here in 21st century America 
knowing that things like this may be coming. So how then should we live? Well, these men didn't don't have a hero story to tell. They got picked up, they got bagged and tagged, and they got broken. But rather than run off and never confront the church of the living God again, rather than live a hermetic life, hermetic life in the woods someplace, rather than just count themselves as a castaway and as a shipwreck, they came to the church of God. They came to their brethren. And they didn't pull any punches about their own guilt and their own failings. And, and I think they laid it out pretty clear what was going on in their minds, what was going on in their hearts. And how surprised they were at their own failings. And they came to that body of believers And they said, we've sinned against you and we've sinned against God. And we've come to lay our case before you and ask for your forgiveness. My, my, my. What a thing, friend. What a thing. A lot could be said about the necessity of forgiveness in the church. For, er- for erring brethren. Gal- the book of Galatians is pretty clear on that. The book of Second Corinthians is pretty clear on that. When you see it laid out in a practical example like this. These men needed the forgiveness of their brethren. And if their brethren had, had withheld that from them. The brethren would have been in sin. And these men had done a horrible thing. And there's no way to gloss over. And 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 and. and Treated as not being a terrible thing. From what I can gather from later history. Is these men were accepted back into the congregation. And they spent the rest of their lives doing. What they should have been doing. In light of this failure. Not that it hung over their head. Not that anyone ever presented it to them. and, And said well you know we would trust you. But there was that one time. But I do find it hard to believe. I'll have to ask these guys when I get to heaven. I do find it hard to believe that that didn't, that this event didn't cast a shadow in their own mind over the rest of their life and the rest of their ministry. It would be very difficult to not feel like I was a second class citizen after having done this. But my goodness, the courage it took to stand in front of people, your brethren, whom you've let down, and whom you've betrayed, to stand in front of them and not say, how dare you judge me, and not say how unloving and how unkind you are that you don't accept me in my sin. No, that's not what these fellows did. They said, we have transgressed against you, and we transgressed against God, and we've hurt your reputation, and we've hurt the reputation of the church, and we've hurt the reputation of the Lord Jesus Christ, and all we have to offer is our contrition and our sorrow and our repentance. My, my, my. Maybe. Just maybe. That's something we're missing. Maybe that's something we could look back and uh, and learn a thing or two about. It's in the scriptures, but sometimes it's, even things in the scriptures just seem like a a theoretical kind of thing until until you're sitting there looking at it. I saw a situation once where a young girl. Got out in sin and she, uh, there was a baby on the way. She stood in front of the church and apologized. She was involved in some of the ministries of that church. She stood in front of the church and apologized. She apologized to some of the younger people in the church that were looking up to her. And she withdrew herself from being actively involved in some of the ministries of the church. And I thought back then, this is one of the bravest things I'd ever seen a person do.
Brethren, Jesus Christ deserves people who will serve him all the days of their lives. And should you mess up in that area, Jesus Christ deserves people who will get back up off the ground, seek his face for forgiveness, restore fellowship with the brethren, and serve Jesus Christ for the rest of their lives. That's our heritage. That's our family history right there. Men, women doing the best they can, and when the best they can ain't good enough, they get it right, and they keep on rolling. Well, there you go. I guess I've said my piece. See you around.